So for some reason, I get more requests for this movie than for any other movie. Okay. Jean Cocteau's 1946 black and white classic, La Belle et la Bête, famously opens with an appeal to viewers asking them to open their hearts and minds to the innocent and magical worldview of a child, to allow themselves to believe that castles can be enchanted and that yes, the heart of a man can beat beneath the hide of a beast. Well, I did some digging and it turns out that the live action Beauty and the Beast originally had an homage to Cocteau's opening for their 2017 remake of the original Disney animated classic. It said, We invite you to open your hearts and minds to the magical worldview of pedantic nitpickers who point out plot holes in fairy tales, which we are now kowtowing to, apparently. Here's a movie for you, guy who kept pointing out that according to Matt, the prince was only 11 when he got turned into a beast. That's pretty messed up, right? That's not logical. Open your heart like the pedantic who opines, How did the town forget that the monarch had disappeared? Plot hole ding! Wow. I hate it. So apparently the intent with the remake of Disney's animated classic Beauty and the Beast was to respond to every bad faith criticism lobbed at the original, like, well, why were the servants enchanted too? They didn't do anything wrong. And Belle's not feminist enough. Make that she reads an active, active transgression against the patriarchy. Teaching another girl to read isn't one enough. And give her an invention subplot that goes nowhere. Effectively, Disney has gone and made a movie which differs in content only in that it appears to exist to appease the pedantic f**ks of YouTube with their decades of bad faith criticism. And forever having enabled that atmosphere of pedantic f**kery that led to the creation of a film that goes out of its way to address the plot holes of the film that it is based on? Uh, I will never cease my penance walk. But I am going to complain about this movie for a really long time, so strap in. It's important to contextualize this movie in the trend that it is the current apotheosis of, that being Disney live action remakes. And these live action remakes seem to pose themselves not as simple remakes, but as responses to criticisms of the films that they are remaking. For Maleficent, it posits that Maleficent was misunderstood and that the narrator of the original movie was unreliable. For The Jungle Book, it posits that, hey, maybe Shere Khan had a point and Mowgli is dangerous. But for Beauty and the Beast, the response seems to be fixing plot holes that weren't actually problems or plot holes to begin with. <laughs> And you may be asking yourself, is this really an overlong nitpicky complainy video complaining about how overlong nitpicky clickbait film criticism has influenced the actual text in the current trend of live action Disney remakes? Yes. We begin not with the bad bitch who got this party started Maleficent, nor the original animated Beauty and the Beast, nor even the evil genius current CEO of the Disney company, AKA boringly competent daddy Bob Iger. It starts with the Robert Moses of the Disney company, daddy of daddies, Michael Eisner. Because important to remember is that Michael Eisner was Bob Iger's mentor in the 1990s and early 2000s. And that the reason Iger had the opportunity to enjoy this long run as CEO of the Disney company was because of his unwavering fealty to the Regina Georgia Hollywood CEOs Michael Eisner. In a 1981 letter Eisner wrote to Paramount executives before he jumped ship to become the CEO of the Disney company, he penned what is widely considered to be his ethos and possibly the most 1980s thing ever written. We have no obligation to make art, said Eisner. We have no obligation to make history. We have no obligation to make a statement, but to make money. It is often important to make history, to make art, or to make some significant statement. In order to make money, we must always make entertaining movies. And if we make entertaining movies, at times we will reliably make history, art, a statement, or all three. We may even win awards. This was an ethos carried through to his time at Disney. That said, Eisner was also super cognizant of the value of brand prestige. And ironically, in his earlier years, he was super resistant to the whole concept of releasing Disney classics onto VHS. As this, he worried, would lower the prestige of the brand. But boy did he change his tune when Pinocchio, the first release to VHS because it was considered lower rung among the classics, sold out of its first run. Lesson learned here, repackaging Disney classics is a safe, lucrative bet. This would reach its apotheosis with the downright parodic phase of direct-to-video sequels, producing such classics as The Hunchback of Notre Dame 2, I was lost, but now The Fox and the Hound 2, and Cinderella 3, A Twist in Time. <laughs> the best one of this lot, yes, I will stand by that. I have seen them all because of f***ing course I have. <laughs> Ursula's crazy sister! During this era, we also saw the expansion of Disney Renaissance properties adapted for Broadway. This became a trend that continues to this day. In the 90s, we saw Beauty and the Beast, The Lion King, and Aida? Yeah, that was a Disney joint. Okay. Such a 
But the thing that we are presently living through was not the first attempt at repackaging Disney classics for live action. Seeing the success of properties like Beauty and the Beast on Broadway and VHS sales, Eisner took an eye towards live action remakes of animated classics, beginning with The Jungle Book in 1994. This one had a sexy Mowgli. But Eisner's real event was 101 Dalmatians in 1996, starring Glenn Close. I've no use for babies. <laughs> Both of these movies did okay. 101 Dalmatians did really pretty well, raking in 136 million in domestic box office grosses and unleashing an avalanche of plush dogs and other merchandise and eventually garnering a sequel. During this period, there were also remakes of old live action movies like The Parent Trap, starring Lindsay Lohan, which unexpectedly grossed $92 million, proving that there was indeed a market for this sort of thing. But these were not huge successes, and after event movie Pearl Harbor was eviscerated by critics, Eisner became much more bearish on the whole concept of event movies in general. Movies like The Jungle Book 94 and 101 Dalmatians didn't really start a trend, where newer films like Maleficent and Cinderella of 2015 did. The final element to the formation of this version of Beauty and the Beast is one we can't really pin on Eisner, and that is the recent trend for Disney movies to make metatextual commentary on the Disney company and the Disney brand in general. It's there in Moana. If you wear a dress and you have an animal sidekick, you're a princess. It's there in Enchanted, like the whole movie. And dear God, Frozen. Who married the man she just met? It's true love! Whoa. Audiences love it when Disney knowingly pokes fun at itself. Do animals talk to you? No. Were you poisoned? No. Cursed? Cursed? No. Kidnapped, Kidnapped or, or enslaved? No. Are you guys okay? Should I call the police? And they really loved it with Beauty and the Beast, didn't they? I'm talking to a candle. Candelabra. Thanks, I hate it. Eisner's story as CEO of the Disney company is very much a mixed bag. He oversaw the success of the Disney Renaissance, yes, but he was also responsible for a string of acquisitions and bad ideas, which could take up many, many, many episodes, but I'm not going into here. Iger certainly took to heart Eisner's wisdom of not being obligated to make art or history, but to make money, which manifested as safe investments. But Iger invests safely, and much bigger than Eisner ever did. As a result, Disney's stock has quadrupled in value since Eisner's departure in 2005. Iger in 2018 is able to execute Eisner's vision of repackaging Disney properties for live action without making the brand feel cheap like Eisner eventually would with his reliance on direct-to-video sequels. In effect, Iger has mastered what the Disney company refers to internally as brand integrity. And moreover, the Disney company under Iger has figured out the secret ingredient. It's not enough to just do a live action remake of a beloved classic starring Glenn Close. New live action Disney needs to be metatextually responding to some criticism of either the Disney company, the brand, or of the property it is remaking. So now we know how we got here. Let's take a look at what we got. In my grand tradition of flaccid attempts to be balanced, I'm going to first try to list the things I don't hate. But I gotta be honest, there's not much here. At least Phantom of the Opera had Patrick Wilson and Minnie Driver. Okay, I am going to find some stuff I don't hate. Let's see, there's gotta be some stuff. Okay, Lumiere and Cogsworth have a different dynamic in the remake than they do in the original. Rather than them squabbling and Cogsworth constantly trying to restrain Lumiere, here they don't really fight, and Cogsworth wants to stand up to the beast. You can't talk to us like that, I forbid it. And Lumiere's kind of trying to help him with that. Of course, that doesn't really go anywhere. <laughs> Cogsworth never does stand up to the beast, so it's an arc that is added with no payoff. It's different. I mean, it's not good, but I guess I don't hate it. Uh, but we still had to know Homo. Oh! I've been so lonely. Back to a God, this is hard. Um, Tooch and Audrey McDonald, love those two. Don't love the characters, they are superfluous and add nothing, but I always love me some Tooch. And Audrey McDonald should just be in more everything, so sure. Um, this owl, damn, that is a sweet owl. Love that owl. Oh, and Kevin Klein. Okay, this is actually one change I unambiguously like. Like turning Maurice from an infantilized man baby into a gentle, sensitive clockmaker. And Klein sells it. That actually really, really works. It's all right. And that's it. 
The original DVD release of Beauty and the Beast in 1991 included a commentary track in which directors Kirk Wise and Gary Trousdale and producer Don Hahn were already audibly frustrated with people trying to over-explain and outsmart the logic of an enchanted castle. The most relevant bit that sticks out in my mind is where they try to explain, or rather, kind of infer they shouldn't have to explain, the internal logic of Be Our Guest. Every piece of flatware doesn't necessarily have a corresponding human equivalent, but it was a lot more fun to have dancing flatware and dancing silverware. Like, it's an enchanted castle. Ergo, the stuff in it is also enchanted. That doesn't mean that everything that moves in the castle has a one-to-one -one human equivalent. But because one of the selling points of this movie is the over-explanation of everything, everything needs to be explained in the dialogue. I'm talking to a candle. Candelabra, please. Yep, that's weird. Glad you pointed out how unlikely that is so I can take off the million layers of logic armor in which I have adorned myself so that I can suspend my disbelief. We can't leave things to people's imaginations, then they might go make an internet about it. See, it's stuff like this that legit sucks the magic out of parables and fairy tales, but it needs to be explained to modern audiences that no, not every object in the castle has a human corollary. Hello, what's your name? <laughs> <laughs> that is a hairbrush. Like Madame Crapair, the helpful toilet. Hello, what's your name? Ma belle, your dress, it is stuck in your belt. Ho ho ho, don't worry, it happened to me all the time back when I had legs. An even more frustrating addition is that the movie explained that, yeah, the servants in the castle see themselves as kind of on the hook for the beast being a jerk. You see, when the master lost his mother, and his cruel father took that sweet innocent lad and twisted him up to be just like him, we did nothing. Well, my dear, we were kind of enablers. This is like victims of abuse saying they had it coming and it was their fault because they shouldn't have made him mad. We've made our bed, and we must lie in it. I understand that MovieNitpicks.com has some complaints about us being punished for the actions of a ten-year-old. But you see, my dear, there's a perfectly logical explanation for that too. This is another addition that gets dragged out, because there's also the added element that the Beast's parents were neglectful and shitty, and the staff knew, but they didn't really do anything because it was, you know, an absolute fucking monarchy. But whatever. They see themselves as kind of deserving of their punishment because they didn't help the prince be better when they had a chance, so we're clocks now. Thanks, I hate it. But the overwritten thing I hate the most is when the staff of the castle just explains the plot to Belle. What happens when the last petal falls? The master remains a beast forever, and we become antiques. Another major change in this version was adding more stakes to certain aspects of the plot. Which, you know, in theory, fine. Instead of the rose falling apart, now the entire castle is falling apart. It's not just the possibility of everyone remaining as they are for all time. The staff are becoming more and more inanimate as they inch closer to Rose Mageddon, which... I grew three more feathers, and I just plucked yesterday. You know, again, fine. Not the worst thing ever as it adds clearer stakes. But, this adds to the problem as by adding these higher stakes, they don't account for plot elements that they do keep from the original animated movie. Namely, the punishment of basically condemning his entire castle of ceasing to exist doesn't really jive with his decision to let Belle go. I let her go. You what? Master, how could you do that? Adding more stakes around the staff adds a whole host of problems. Namely, turning the Beast's lack of concern for his staff from anger management problems and general immaturity into being actually morally reprehensible. I set her free. I'm sorry I couldn't do the same for all of you. I guess. Boss of the year. Sorry, Cave Daddy. So adding these higher stakes kind of zaps the meaning from the moment where he decides to let Belle go. It turns the Beast's decision from a moment of personal growth into a trolley problem. Whose life matters more, Maurice or, or every living being in the goddamn castle? In this version, the Beast letting Belle go is no longer him placing Belle's needs in front of his own, but instead deciding that Maurice's life is worth more than everyone in the castle, who he has now doomed to death. Point being here that the movie wanted to up the stakes, fine, but it fundamentally changed what is supposed to be the emotional core of the story, that being Beast's growth as a person who can put other people's needs before his own. Because this rubs up against the whole thrust of the story, the higher stakes kind of necessitates that the enchanted objects explain their plight to Belle. What happens when the last petal falls? The master remains a beast forever, 
and we become... Antiques. Yes, logically, it would make sense for Lumiere, Cogsworth, and Mrs. Potts to do this, but it diminishes what should be the emotional core of the story, that Belle develops these feelings on her own terms, in her own time. She doesn't do it because their fucking lives on the line. She does it because she falls in love with him because he begins to live as his best self, not because of a trolley problem, which she proceeds to ignore anyway because Maurice needs help. And while we're here on the topic of terrible editing, what is this? Chip! Have you seen Chip? He ran off! Oh no. Mom! What was Chip jumping from? <laughs> Why is this happening? Was this scene really in need of more stakes out of nowhere? Oh no. Mom! If I can't live as a cop, I'll die as a cop! See, over-explaining everything in this case not only insults the intelligence of the audience, which is perhaps deserved because there is a certain sect of film commentators who have built careers off of complaining that their hands are not being held through the entire narrative, it also diminishes what should be a fairly simple but powerful story about love, forgiveness, redemption, and discovering your best self. But it's really hard for the Beast to discover his best self in this movie. Because there isn't one. The Beast was a challenge in the original movie because he had to be scary, repulsive, a huge jerk, and eventually extremely likable. Part of this is accomplished through the medium of animation, which with a skilled animator is much better able to capture clear and complex emotions. This shot early on in the film shows an inner conflict and complexity at a point in the narrative where he's still the bad guy, and all with no dialogue. The Beast's transformation is inspired by wanting to do right by Belle, and Belle being kind to him in turn is earned. She doesn't become his life coach, nor does she train him in the art of being nice, but she does give credit where credit is due. 2017 Beast is a massive prick. Idiot! And I don't mean like he's an arrogant prick, but then he learns the error of his ways. Like, I think, I think this is supposed to be charming. Actually, Romeo and Juliet's my favorite play. Ugh. Why is that not a surprise? I'm sorry? See, this is what is called a neg, popularized by Neil Strauss's 2005 book, The Game. No, I don't have a copy of The Game lying around. Oh, all that heartache and pining and... The Beast saves Belle from wolves, and while he's out cold, Mrs. Potts explained that it's kind of the staff's fault he grew up to be a jerk. And when he comes to, and Belle professes her fondness for Romeo and Juliet... Ugh. Why is that not a surprise? Classic neg. When I enter the room, laughter dies. Well, it might be because you abuse them and they're afraid of you. Idiot! See, this moment could have paid off by adding, like, one line where she explains that his staff is afraid of him and maybe it could be a growth moment. When I enter the room, laughter dies. But, nah. There are a lot of small bewildering changes to the Beast's character that I just, I don't understand why they're there. Gone is this humanizing moment where the Beast realized his anger got the better of him and he made a huge mistake. Get <laughs> Go! So when he shows up to save Belle from wolves, it's kind of out of nowhere, because he never has that emotional beat of realizing he made a mistake. In this version, Belle doesn't have a deal with the beast, so she can't renege on it. Where are you going? Promise or no promise, I can't stay here another minute. Which not only begs the question of why she sticks around, it also adds a particularly yikes dynamic to the scene where she's running away and everyone in the castle is trying to imprison her. Go, 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 go. Here he is beating her in the face with a giant snowball, which he then laughs about. Not even like an, oh shit. Like, bet she broke her nose. Then followed by the change in the library scene. In the original, it follows the beast's change of heart. He wants to do something for Belle that she will appreciate. I've never felt this way about anyone. I want to do something for her. In the remake, it's just him showing off. So many better things to read. Like what? Well, there are a couple of things in here you could start with. Like, check out my library. It's pretty sweet. You can look at it, I guess. All of these small changes add up. Beast doesn't earn Belle's affection, so she's trying harder than he is and ends up his f***ing life coach like she was in Belle's Enchanted Christmas and ends up doing all the f***ing work. Come on! The Beast is just a mediocre man who fails into success by possessing the right objects despite never making any effort to rise to her needs and figure out what she wants. 
Fine, I guess I'll go down to your level. And this scene doesn't read that way in the animated movie, where the beast actually makes an effort to use a spoon, but he physically cannot. But the worst thing is that these two have no chemistry at all. It's foolish, I suppose, for a creature like me to hope that one day he might earn your affection. But all the same, I never really buy that she grows to care for him. It's honestly hilarious how quickly she ghosts him when he lets her go. And then at the end when she's crying over him, it's just, there's just no chemistry here. I just don't buy it. And this scene is super not helped by the freaking enchantress barging in on what is supposed to be a private intimate moment. Thanks for that, Becky. It would have been great if he negged her after he turned back into a man. Said something like, wow, your pores are much less noticeable now that I have human eyes. And she's like, it is you. be longer so it pads us over with a bunch of crap that doesn't go anywhere some of these additions are plot related a small example is the rose thing a plot element from the original story Belle's bitchy sisters ask their father for niceties where the virtuous humble beauty asks only for a single rose in the original movie the rose is a gift offered by the enchantress which then turns into the film's ticking clock the 17 remake decides hey why don't we have both so the new movie keeps the rose and adds a backup rose, as in the original story, and this goes nowhere and I hate it. Belle doesn't have bitchy sisters who ask for nicer things, with the humble Belle asking only for a rose. Here Belle asks for a rose because... What can I bring you from the market? A rose? Like the one in the painting? I don't know, something to do with the mom. And we'll get to the mom. Food and water is fine, but don't you dare touch my roses. Apparently that's what happens around here when you pick a flower. Oh, but it doesn't stop there because we have to over explain everything. The beast is like traumatized by roses. I received eternal damnation for one. I'm merely locking him away. He explains this with his words and that is why he locks up Maurice. Another truly bewildering change is Lumiere and Cogsworth going behind the beast's back rather than having that humanizing moment and having it be his decision to put her in a nice room instead of the tower. I'll show you to your room. My room? But I thought... You want to, you want to stay in the tower? No. Then follow me. Therefore, it is Lumiere who told her not to go into the West Wing. The castle is your own now, so feel free to go anywhere you like. Except the West Wing. Which we do not have. Not the beast. What's in the west? It's forbidden! So there is no tension and there's no betrayal in this scene because the beast never laid down that boundary which she then crossed. What are you doing here? Why you mad, bro? But some of the changes are character depthening. <laughs> I think the intent here was to make the town sympathetic and redeemable, which they weren't really in the original, and that was kind of the point. <laughs> the original movie actually has a rather cynical opinion of the masses. We don't like what we don't understand, in fact it scares us, and this monster is mysterious at least. That people are easily duped in the face of things that are strange and foreign, and it doesn't pull its punches on that point. But the 17 remake does by making the town redeemable, which isn't really earned, nor is there any emotional payoff when... I don't know, Mrs. Potts reunites with Mr. Potts? And Cogsworth is reunited with his apparent nag of a wife and then begs to be turned back into a clock. Turn back into a clock. Turn back into a clock. Thanks, I hate it. So on the one hand, there's this bid to make Gaston kind of sympathetic by implying that he has PTSD, a truly stupid and insulting change that adds nothing. Look, Gaston doesn't need damage. He is the high school jock everybody admires. He's a hunter. He doesn't need to be more than that. He just needs to be a big handsome dummy everyone loves because he's arrogant and good looking. Because that tends to be how it happens in the real world and that's kind of the point of the movie. So the addition of Gaston was in the war is awful. Not only does it add backstory that goes nowhere, but as the film goes on, it's less he was in the war, he's damaged so much as he's like a blood psychopath that appears to be aroused by the mere thought of violence. Happy thoughts, go back to the war. Blood, explosions, hmm. countless widows. widows. The remake has Gaston giving Maurice the benefit of the doubt, and it seems to be going in the direction of making Gaston kind of more reasonable and sympathetic, but then boom, blood rage. So instead of Gaston being widely admired, not only is his characterization inconsistent and splotchy... Wonderful book you have there. Have you read it? Uh, well, not that one, but you know, books. The town is kind of skeptical towards him. Gaston, did you try to kill Maurice? So much that during Gaston, LeFou is paying people to sing. 
Why add this? Why can't Gaston be genuinely admired by a small town who is taken in by a good looking guy who is secretly internally monstrous? Why do we need to make the town both more bigoted and more sympathetic? They're a poor provincial town. They're basic. They take everything at face value, including Gaston, Belle, and the Beast. That's the whole point. I hate it. But the worst addition has got to be the Book of Teleportation. Okay, so the Bell's Plague Mother backstory change is a suggestion that should have been killed in the screenplay stage because it is so, so pointless and adds nothing. So Bell's mother was an artist and died of plague. Maurice never tells Bell for some reason. Please just tell me one more thing about her. But don't worry, Beast has like a book that not only transcends space, but also time. So towards the end, they go to Paris. Beast makes a tourism joke. The Champs Elysees, no, too touristy. Belle talks about the Paris of my childhood. This is the Paris of my childhood. There's a plague mask. Doctor Smart. And Belle's like, I get it now. And I guess they bond over their mother's dying young and tragic. Then later in the scene in the padded wagon, I know what happened to Maman. I learned about tragic backstory, Papa. And now we can resolve the conflict we didn't have and also has nothing to do with the story. The addition of the space-time book begs the question of why they never used it later. Hmm, if Maurice is in danger, it sure would be handy if we, I don't know, had some sort of device that got us from point A to point B in an instant. The worst aspect of this is that it adds inner conflict that doesn't really need to be resolved. Belle wants to know her backstory. What happened to Mom? Fine. What does that have to do with her learning to love the beast? What does that have to do with the beast learning to put her needs before his own? Hell, it doesn't even really drive a wedge between Belle and Maurice. It's not driving a conflict between her and anyone. It really has nothing to do with Gaston. It's just jammed in there, and it feels like it's yet another metatextual response. Where are all the Disney moms? Ask the clickbait sites. Well, here's your answer. She dead. Does it add anything to the story? Does it enhance the characters? Does it deepen any relationships? No. But it does offer a response to the complaint that Disney princesses have largely absent mother figures, which itself wasn't really a criticism of this story so much as a question of the broader trend in Disney movies. Where are the moms? Hey, did you know that this movie has the first gay? When it was announced that LeFou would become the first out gay character in a Disney movie, the L's, the G's, the B's, the T's, and of course all you filthy, filthy Q's responded with uproarious applause. So yeah, the LGBT community responded overwhelmingly with f***ing really, which got upgraded to are you f***ing kidding me when we saw the final product and the only out thing about LeFou that wasn't completely subtext was this shot. Wow, such gay. Very representation. So a lot of people were very validly annoyed that this was the best that we could get for the first out gay in a Disney movie. Well, I used to be on Gaston's side, but we are so in a bad place right now. You're too good for him anyway. The buffoon character, whose name translates to the fool. You're welcome, gays. But the worst offender on the front of cheap, safe Hollywood liberalism is Belle, feminist icon. What on earth are you doing? Teaching another girl to read isn't one enough. Introducing Beast for She. Feminism written by straight white men whose feminism appears to have pretty much began and ended with Disney feminism from the 90s. Hmm. I'm a fast learner. A damsel in distress? I'm a damsel. I'm in distress. I can handle this. Have a nice day. Okay, and I don't, I honestly don't want to shit all over he for she. I think a lot of people in America and the UK miss that it's supposed to be like, you know, a, a global thing. This is not a dig on Emma Watson, who I honestly think is a net positive and I really respect that she uses her platform to advance a more globally oriented brand of feminism. But <laughs> somewhere along the line, Disney decided, hey, as long as we're using this movie to respond to every criticism lobbed against the original, we should probably go ahead and appease the feminists while we're here. So Belle helps Maurice with his clocks. Thank you. Maurice calls her ahead of her time. Who is so ahead of her time, different, 
she leans in. Belle attempts to escape the castle twice, which is so much more feminist than the original where she attempts to escape a mirror once. Jesus Christ, I'm surprised that they didn't like have Belle like look directly into the camera and ask the audience if they thought she was developing Stockholm Syndrome. The biggest and most egregious addition is, of course, Belle's goddamn washing machine. A thing she invented while also promoting female literacy. But oh no, here comes the patriarchy. What on earth are you doing? Teaching another girl to read isn't one enough. Wow, it sure will be satisfying later in the movie when this guy learns the error of his ways and that female literacy is important. Oh wait. And then they smash her washing machine. <laughs> Just destroy it. I mean, at least you tried, Belle. All I wanted was to teach a child to read. Too bad that washing machine or your inventing skills will never be mentioned in the movie again. And I honestly hate to point out historical accuracy issues in a Disney movie because I do not care. I realize that this is a sticking point for a lot of people complaining about the accuracy of the era that inspired the film, but I don't care. Boy, there's no depth to how much I don't care about that line of thinking. However, since the movie decides to play up the historical aspect of the film and decides to definitively set the film in a period of French history that wasn't looking too bright for absolute f***ing monarchs. After all, miss, this is France. Female literacy was not a thing that was exactly frowned upon in this particular culture in this particular period in history. There were lots of magazines specifically for young women. The original Beauty and the Beast was even published in one of those magazines. So this was not a thing. And I hate this, because not only was it not a thing, it doesn't go anywhere. At no point does this guy or anyone in the town really ever have a come to Jesus moment and realize that like sexism is bad and literacy is good. But hey, beast for she. Likewise, Belle being an inventor also never pays off. She never like invents a thing that helps the beast or the castle staff. Hell, she doesn't even get them out of the padded wagon at the end. In the original, Chip blasts them out. You guys gotta try this thing. In this version, Maurice does it, but don't worry, he uses Belle's hairpin. Lean in, Belle. The worst thing about this is that the movie kind of implies that the bigotry of the town is A, partially enchantment induced, which, yuck. B, a problem that can slash is solved, all they need to do is get woke. I remember, I do. It adds all this crap about bigotry without understanding its underlying causes, which are neither rational nor enchantment. The original movie was actually really good about this subtext. It gets that the bigotry of the town is heavily emotion driven and not really dictated by logic. That's kind of the point, and that's why Gaston is so easily able to manipulate them. The beast will make off with your children. He'll come after them in the night. No. The beast will make off with your jobs. He'll come crossing over the border at night. Wow, these villagers sure do have a lot of socioeconomic anxiety. Meanwhile, the New York Times is over here writing like 800 profiles on anti-beast villagers and why they still follow Gaston. But in the remake, the villagers see the error of their ways while not demonstrating that they have actually learned anything. But don't worry, they won't be sexist or bigoted anymore. <laughs> and suddenly, he wasn't racist anymore. <laughs> Problem solved. I'll be the racist. Well, not anymore. Dragon. Boy, that was easy. Beast for she. So it's not even that these common bad faith criticisms of the original movie exist and are such popular talking points. Yeah, that is kind of annoying and basic, but you know, whatever. But the key to success under Iger, where it never took off under Eisner, is that these live action remakes have to add something to their originals, make meta commentary on them. So here we have a film that fixes plot holes that don't need to be fixed, adds dimension to characters that don't go anywhere, tacks on weird plot crap that likewise does not go anywhere, and shoves in some lazy hat tips to their version of progressive but that this formula has proven so successful, boy, I can't wait for Dumbo now with more emotional support and Mulan, but not a musical, because China doesn't like musicals. But the worst thing to me is how much this new approach doesn't feel like Disney. And by Disney, I mean Walt, who independent of Cocteau had a similar approach to storytelling. According to Walt Disney, I do not make films primarily for children. I make them for the child in all of us, whether he be six or 60. Call the child innocence. The worst of us is not without innocence, although buried deeply it might be. In my work, I try to reach and speak to that innocence, showing it the fun and joy of living. The original Beauty and the Beast feels in the spirit of both Walt and Cocteau, but the new one is just cynical. 
The merger with Fox Studios is another major element here. That means fewer movies will be released in general, and given how safe these event live action remakes are, more resources will be put into far fewer productions. Again, to go back to that Eisner memo, we have no obligation to make art. We have no obligation to make history. We have no obligation to make a statement, but to make money. It is often important to make history, to make art, or to make a significant statement. In order to make money, we must always make entertaining movies, and if we make entertaining movies at time, we will reliably make history, art, a statement, or all three. So, Disney under Iger certainly makes money. Congrats for that. But they are no longer making history. This is just safe regurgitation of brands we've already seen catering to a nostalgia-hungry market. And that wouldn't be so bad, but more and more this comes at the cost of the creation of anything new. And when Iger saw the breadth of his domain, he wept, for there were no more properties to remake. Parts of this episode were inspired by reading James B. Stewart's book, Disney War, an audiobook I listened to while stuck in traffic. And I like to listen to really long nonfiction like this book while stuck in traffic. This episode was sponsored in part by Audible. Audible has the largest selection of audiobooks on the planet, and there is a lot of really great long nonfiction that is perfect for your otherwise wasted hours stuck in traffic. Audible members get a credit every month good for any audiobook in their store, regardless of price, and unused credits roll over to the next month. If you don't like an audiobook, you can exchange it with no hassle. Plus, your audiobooks are yours to keep forever, even if you cancel. You can go to audible.com slash Ellis. Yes, it's just audible.com slash my legal given name to get started. Or via text, you can text Lindsay Ellis to 500-500. You can also find a link in the summary. This episode was also supported in part by our patrons on Patreon. Thank you as always for your continued support. We could not make overlong complaining videos about the Disney company without viewers like you.